Hello everyone. <coughs> Today the topic is uh, not something on the mainstream for a technical organization would carry out. This is a deviation. However, this topic indirectly talks about how to make better integers, how to make better performance. Uh, what's the innovative part in this session, in this talk is uh, if you learn these skills, if you master these skills, you can become a better engineer, better performer. So, and this session is not targeted at teaching all these concepts within a 20 minutes. This is more of an eye opener. This is a session targeted to introduce those features, introduce those skills that you need to learn, and direct you to some of the sources so that. Uh, you have to do your homework, you have to understand the initial idea and learn. So psychology is the, the main domain of the talk. Uh, and we are picking a very niche area of that psychology which was built within the last 15 to 16 years. 50 to 60 years. So let's start with the main focus. What we are mainly looking at. How smart we are with the human connection. Uh, human connections talk about the self as well as the others. How smart we are with other humans as well as with the self. Uh, is there an index? Is there a way of measuring how smart a given individual when it comes to dealing with himself as well as dealing with others? The very well known index to measure intelligence in the world is called IQ. So from what we know from the from the norm that we measure intelligence of a person based on IQ. So intelligence quotient based on that. This is an index. This index talks about if you have an average IQ of 140 or more, you are highly gifted, you are a genius. Right? In an organization like us, we are looking at individuals between 110 to 120, something of this range. This is where we are. <coughs> there can be few here, there can be few here, but this is predominantly our way. <coughs> so, so we already have an index to measure how intelligent an individual is. Uh, what's the problem with this? What is the uh, weakness? In this? Let's let's go to an example. So before we go to an example of the weakness, let's understand how IQ works. Let me get a simple example. If you summarize 24H in a D means 24 hours in a day. What is 26L of the A? What's 7D of the W? What is 7W of the of the W? So <coughs> people with average IQ can guess this. Anyone can guess any of these? Six letters of the alphabet. Six letters of the alphabet. Yeah, 26 letters of the alphabet. Seven D of the W? Alright, that's simple. What is 7 W of the W? 7 7 wonders of the W. So, what's wrong with IQ? So, most of you were able to guess at least one or two out of that list. So, that shows you have a uh, IQ which is being developed through your education, through your other weekends. <coughs> Let's look at this proper. A serial killer. Very well known as Una Bomber. Right? He was trying to, uh, he was engaged in nationwide bombing campaign uh, against people involved in modern technology. 
we are trying to kill superheroes in technology. So what's your first impression about this person? The very first impression about the person? The stupid person. Right? Why is he trying to kill all the people who are contributing to the world? And what's or maybe a first first thing that comes to your word, uh, mind is madman, so mad person. But surprisingly, IQ of 167. American mathematician. So the intelligence, what we believe, and if you measure it in terms of IQ you wouldn't be able to measure the full picture. So what this means, if this guy came for an interview at Leipzig, Rasika would have hired him with no doubt. Then he would have killed all of us. That's Rasika's fault. <laughs> that, that's how we perceive intelligence, right? So there is a missing point, right? Let's, let's go for another example. Sheldon Cooper, very high IQ, but would you tolerate him? Really hard to tolerate. So let's, uh, so if IQ is not just enough to measure intelligence, what are the other ways of measuring? What are the other ways of figuring out whether a person is intelligent and whether a person is an old one? There's a theory, finding, uh, by an American psychologist called the area of multiple intelligence. What he simply tries to say is uh, intelligence that differentiates into multiple categories rather than seeing intelligence as a dominated by a single general ability. So IQ is predominantly on your logical uh, ability and mathematical ability and variation of those two. We understand by simply knowing your maths and having a good uh, analytical mind, but is not good enough. Most of us, by default, has these, the mathematical and the analytical mind. That doesn't make you a perfect software engineer or a software engineering professional or a good <coughs> engineer, good uh, asset to a product. There's a little bit more to learn. So this concept was <coughs> coined in by a professor called Howard Gardner. Frames of mind, the theory of multiple intelligence is the book. And this is one highly recommended book that you need to read, uh, which talks about how intelligent, <coughs> how multiple intelligence are uh, being separated and how, how you learn each one, how you master it. Let's look at the big picture. So, intelligence is not just single ability, it goes into nine sectors, but this has only eight. Uh, I'll explain why the ninth one is missing. First one, body smart, these are like the straight words, and this is the scientific. Body smart or bodily kinesthetic. What that means is people who, are, who have higher intelligence in terms of controlling their bodies, like a gymnast, like a sports, right? they understand their body. Their body and the mind is pretty connected than the rest of us. Okay? And a good dancer for that matter. Can control their body and that's a level of intelligence. Interpersonal. People who are good at making relationships and working with others. There are people who are uh, highly gifted in terms of talking to strangers, making relationships, and some of, some of us are not so good at that. Word smart, linguistic, that is learning the language, a control over a language that you have, having a good command over a language. And logic smart is the IQ that we usually know, the logical and that. In school, what we learn, word smart and logic smart. We learn languages and we learn logical subjects. Uh, 
uh, Nate the smart, naturalistic. He's a person who loves the surrounding. They like to go camping and they, they have abilities of differentiating species like different types of birds. They can identify different types of trees by they have sense of uh, weather changes and people have that ability. So that's under this category. Self power is interpersonal. People who are really happy about themselves, they understand what they can do, they understand their uh, skills and their weaknesses, and they are quite happy about themselves. And this is another area that people should. Visual or the picture spark is uh, spatial, spatial uh, smart intelligence is known as your ability to process things in your mind. Uh, a better example is blind people, when you explain something to them, they have no sense of visual sight. Maybe they are blind all in their lives. So if you are blind from your birth, you have no sense of visuals. You don't understand what, what it looks like. But their spatial intelligence has developed by listening to something. They can visualize that in their head. People like this are really good at navigation. They can remember roads, regardless of the country, whether you are Sri Lanka or US, they are good at roads. They can <coughs> Visualize objects at different <coughs> angles. Right? That's the kind of processing in their head. And music mark. People who can sing high vocal pitches, control their voice. So that's the category. Kind of people who can sing. It's a music mark. So that is eight out of nine intelligences that has been identified in the theory of multiple intelligences. And there's another one which is called spiritual intelligence. However, uh, Gartner didn't want this in the list. He said, uh, we want to commit to this. He says, spiritual intelligence probably mislead people. Hence, he would say, I'm okay for a category called existential, existential in, uh, intelligence, which is more like an adaptive, like, you walk into a uh, conservative country like Qatar and you understand they have a <coughs> very strict religious process and you adapt to that. Is this kind of uh, related to this? You understand, you, un you naturally understand the religious and spiritual aspects. <coughs> but this was not added to the, the co eight. This is okay, but not considered as an, uh, another category of intelligence. So out of the eight, so this is Gardner on his multiple intelligences. This is his theory. Then comes our focus, emotional intelligence. Out of the eight, another person called <coughs> Daniel Gawler, Coining the term, if you concentrate on two intelligences, one is people smart, the social aspect or how smart you are with the others, and interpersonal, which is how comfortable you are with yourself. If you combine these two, understanding the self, understanding of the self, and interaction with others. If you combine these two, that's a extension of the multiple uh, intelligence. You practical, they pra uh, Daniel practically build a theory called emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence <coughs> simply focus on these two aspects. So there are multiple words that one is self and social, the other one is uh, self and the others. So <coughs> it's about you and the rest of the world. And this is the book. Think about it. Right? In an organization, when you are assigned to a team, what would be your preference? Do you want to work with people like Sheldon Cooper, who are 
very high in IQ, but put down everyone around them. No respect to the individuals around. Would you like to work in an environment where people with average IQ but really good, good friends, they understand you, they put effort to understand you and they try to get you into, into their group. <coughs> they are socially good. What would be your preference? First or the second? Naturally your preference is the second, which is which makes you more comfortable. So a team to provide that, they have to be good in EQ. Let's go to uh, <coughs> why EQ. So in the workplace, EQ is more than twice as predictive of performance than IQ. Uh, what that means is, if you recognize the person who's good in EQ, emotional intelligence, if you're good in handling himself and dealing with others, uh, highly you can. It's highly likely that person is going to succeed in the subsequent task than a person who's just good in IQ. If a person is just good in IQ, you have other doubts. Don't know whether this person is going to get adapted with this particular team or whether this person can work with this individual. You have doubts. But if you have a person who's good in EQ, right, he can handle himself and handle the other person, you're pretty confident putting him anywhere. Okay, he will figure it out. Right? So, so from a leader's perspective, if you have built your EQ, emotional intelligence, and given the perception that you are a person who can handle yourself first, you are not a person who, who's going to cry when, there's a, when the weather changes. You are a person much better than that. And you are, you are good with other teams, how to deal with them. That gives competitive advantage. And these are all based on studies, not just something that I pulled out of thin air. 80 to 90 percent of the professional competencies that differentiate top performers are related to their emotional intelligence. Take a bunch of people and, and how we how we pick the top performer out of a team is not simply the guy who has the highest IQ. It can be, can be the guy who has the highest IQ. But 80 to 90 percent is the person with good EQ would be a top performer. At the end of the day, organization is a coordinated effort of a group of people trying to meet the needs of another group of people called customers. So, bunch of people here trying to coordinate with each other, talk to each other, discuss with each other, try to build a product for another bunch of people somewhere else. So, it's a, it starts with you, how you deal with you and how you do, deal with this team and how you deal with your customer. So, what is more important at that point? EQ. Let's go to another example. EQ at workplace. <coughs> so this is some pretty similar thing in uh, different words. Organizations can achieve its goal through a series of daily conversations, interactions and decisions. Each of these involves human. And the more emotionally intelligent they are, the more effective they will be on every level. So this is not a skill that you need to teach it for your leadership or just for your fresh graduate. EQ is all across. Anyone in the organization can have good EQ. Should have good EQ. Now let's put this into a technical framework where we can understand. It starts with personal competencies. What you need to build within you. Relationship competencies. What you need to build with the others. And this has two other aspects. Knowledge and management. All together, we have a partner. So we are talking about personal competence, personal knowledge, and uh, with knowledge, then you need to self-awareness. Awareness of, of the other. Uh, this is again called social awareness. Personal competency management called self-control. How do you control yourself? How do you manage yourself at times? Relationship competencies management is building relationships. How do you go and build a relationship with other people? So emotional EQ in a nutshell, in a framework, this is all about. And it suggests you have four in your got five techniques 
four into five, twenty competencies, which you can go into details. I'm not actually going to go into details of that, but I'm going to give you a sense of that. So, self recognition. This is a this is exactly from the uh, government's book. Emotional self awareness, accurate self assessment, and self confidence. So. I'll just explain this please, but rest of the things we'll uh, skip for the time. First you need to know your skills and weaknesses. And you need to understand this is who you are. And you should be able to measure what is the perception of the others about you. And you think, okay, for instance, uh, let's say I believe that I can drive well, I can drive a car well, but my but the people around me, if their perception is that this person cannot reverse or drive straight, then that conflicts. And some of us have that. They believe, I'm really good at coding. I write superb coding. But the moment you talk to people around you, uh, you get a different perception. So what you believe and what others believe you about, about you is something you need to manage. The self-awareness is fixing that problem and so on and so forth, you have areas to improve. You generally start here. You first have to recognize yourself and fix yourself before you go anywhere. After you do this, you can go to either social awareness or you can go to self-management. From either one of these, you can go to relationship management. So the most difficult one is social regulation, controlling social, controlling others. Uh, dealing with others, that's the fourth one, last one that you need to do. Best place to start is right here. Alright, so now this is pretty much the concept in a nutshell. Next part is, I'm going to put this into, the, 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 how I understood this, I'm going to put this into a, a subject that is known to us. I'm going to present this in terms of computer. So, <coughs> This is just a the I, this is just an idea that I have. This is nothing approval or there's no this is out there. Okay. I'm just trying to put this into a context that all of us can understand. My uh, I would say my uh, proposal is something like this. End of the day, emotion is information. For example, when I get angry. At that point, I probably have done something wrong. But if I take a step back and think, how I got angry at that point? Why? Who made me angry? What was the reason for it? How I could have handled that? All of that is information. Right? So, this information technology, at one point, you can analyze all of that. Second thing which I have realized, each emotion, contain data that is related to our thoughts, attitudes, beliefs and actions. Now the second piece is something not original, something which I have seen in other areas as well, but not in one-to-one -one words. But some people present this something similar. So if you take an emotion, which is information, and if you try to bring the data elements to that, uh, what was I thinking at the time I was sad, right? So that you have that. If you if I think about this event or this person, I get sad. That's a relationship. That's a business rule that you can think of. So that depends on your data. Element. So if you if you want to. So if you can avoid thinking about that situation or that individual, highly likely you wouldn't get sad. So you can reverse it, wire it back. And also you can figure out, when I get angry, what do I do? What are my actions? What are my actions? Why do I react like that? Can I fix my actions next time when I get angry by purpose? That's, a, that's another area to think through. So, this has endless possibilities. 
I, from what I gather, end of the day, this is what EQ is trying to teach you. It's trying to teach you understand yourself, break it down, and for each rule, apply your own theory and bring that to a certain level. Okay. Now I'm shifting gears. Now I'm moving from psychology to biological and neurological aspect. Triune brain. brain. Uh, in uh, neurology, in biology, not from a physical uh, separance, uh, not from a specific, uh, physical separation, but from a logical separation, your brain has three areas. Reptilian is called the survival brain. Reptilian works on very simple terms. Reptilian can only design, uh, it can only do, when you are in danger, you go into this mode. And you you can go to this mode in a second, actually less than a second. Survival brain, when you are in extreme danger, your brain goes to this. In this state, when you are in this state, you have only two actions attached to it, which is called fight or flight. Face the danger or escape the danger. That's all your brain can do. Think of a situation. Let's say sleep set is under alien attack. Some of you will go fight it. Some of you will escape. Simple as that. Right? And you would fight the aliens? Yeah, I'm thinking of the I think that's a that's a way of facing. So fight or flight or face or escape is the only thing you can do with this brain. Next part of the logical brain is called limbic. In your limbic brain. You have very uh, fundamental emotional brain, like your sexual needs are handled by this. Whether you like a person or not, whether you love a person or not, right? whether you want to do something at a very low, at a very primitive level of emotions are handled by this brain. At times, these two together, reptilian, uh, sorry, reptilian and uh, limbic together, if you act only using those two, in a controlled person's mind, you look stupid, right? That's why uh, the term, so in certain situations, like uh, let's say hypothetically that you are in love, that you wouldn't see every, every possible, you don't, you are not logical like that. Right? So your emotional brain and survival brain are the only two things. Is, is this person going to kill me? Oh, no, he's not going to kill me. He or she is not going to kill me. Then probably I love that person. Or probably I'm okay to go out with that person. Those are very limited level, at, uh, <coughs> limited levels of decision making if you simply operate at these two. Emotional intelligence is not at this level. Then we have a big boss called neocortex. That is our thinking brain. This is what we need to improve over a period of time. Uh, and you cannot only live with neocortex as well, right? Let's say the, the whole idea of reptilia is when you are in danger, you should not be thinking about so many things. Right? When a fast bowler like Akhtar is bowling at you, you shouldn't be thinking all the possibilities. Right? You should go with your reptilia, right? do what you can at that point. But when an exam question is asked, you should not use these two. You should probably work here if you need a good grade. IQ and EQ both lives at this level. Okay. Alright, so let's move to another level. Let's, let's talk about the fight or flight situation. Uh, fight or flight, or 
Amitya Dela Hijack talks about a particular situation. Your neocortex, your limbic, is shut down. All you have is your reptilian brain. You can think of only two things. And this situation can be activated within a second. Within a second, you go to this mode, only two things can be done. German Shepherd is trying to attack another dog. He's Rajiv Gandhi was attacked. What was his reptilian brain? At that point, he was trying to escape. He was not fighting back. Because at that split second, all he could do is the best decision is to escape. Sure, escape. Okay. Now, what's the relationship between emotional intelligence and your brain getting hijacked and how that impact day to day life? So, this is the conclusion of the session. This is what happens with amygdala hijacking, which creates a database. In the past, if something was harmful for you, your brain records that as a dangerous situation. Let's say, uh, as a child, you were bitten by a dog. You record that in your brain, dogs are dangerous. Right? Wherever in your life, if that is get recorded in your database, database in technical term, in memory, however in your memory, get persisted that in memory. Whenever you see a dog, you relate that, and your body, you wouldn't go to a completely amygdala hijacked situation. It sends you pulse of signal at that point, saying you are in danger. Moment you get that pulse, your neocortex is out. Now you are back to uh, two basic versions of your memory, reptilian and imp. At that level, your decision making, your social navigation, uh, all the intelligent things that you could do, go drastically down. In the corporate world, this is, this we can relate to having a very fearful boss. If you are scared of your boss, and in the past if you have been very scared of your boss, or, a, or another colleague, or someone in the office, when that person is around, your brain signals little bit of hijack. Not going to hijack the whole body to say fight or escape, but you hesitate. Right? You try to relate that to what happened to you. Okay. So, you try to <laughs> <laughs> so it's good, good that you understand what's going on in your life. So, so when you see that individual, when, when that situation occurs in your daily routine, your body gets hijacked a little. The moment it gets hijacked a little, your thinking ability goes down drastically. That is why people are not performing when their bosses are not treating them right. Number one reason for people to leave organization, their immediate boss. And if you have a colleague in the team who is a threat to you, who is a, who is a danger to you, around him, if that has been marked in your database as a dangerous situation, your thinking, power, your intelligence goes lower. This is a pattern. Moment that happens, your ability to navigate, your ability to do the right thing, drastically goes down. And people, people say this. I, I, I just can't understand what happened at that point. I could have done this, but I just did something silly. That's that sort of complete shutdown of your brain, a slight shutdown of your brain. So people recognize this pattern and say, if you have a fear within our organization, escalate that, talk to Rasik about it, or talk to your uh, leads, and get that fixed, so you have a better workplace. Okay, thank you very much. With that, I leave this for you to read. Uh, and thank you very much. That's it.